Testament scripture this morning is from the Gospel according to Luke, and this is a story about someone else being baptized. I invite you to listen for the word of God. The people were filled with expectation, and everyone wondered whether John might be the Messiah. John replied to them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than me is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The shovel he uses to, sh to sift the wheat from the husk is in his hands. He will clean out his threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn, but he will burn the husks with a fire that cannot be put out. With many other words, John appealed to them, proclaiming good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler, had been criticized harshly because of John, by John because of Herodias, Herod's brother's wife, and because of all the evil he had done. He added this to the list of evil deeds, and he locked John up in prison. When everyone was being baptized, Jesus also was baptized. While he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit came down on him in bodily form like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven, You are my son, whom I love, and you I find happiness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, so in middle school, I had a friend, and his name was Keith. Um, his first name was Keith. His last name was Small, which is not an easy name to have in middle school, especially if you're a boy, because boys grow weird in middle school. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> like, some boys hit sixth grade, and they're like 20 feet tall, and some boys hit sixth grade, and they stay three feet tall. And Keith, Keith Small, was six foot two in seventh grade. And he was taller than everyone else. And I mean everyone. The, uh, you know, me, my teacher, the teachers, the principal, everyone. Keith was six foot two in sixth grade. And that was not an easy life, I think you can imagine, especially for someone whose last name is Small. Because we really like irony. Keith Small was not small in any possible way. And one day, me being me, went up to Keith and asked him, Keith, what's the hardest part of being tall? And um, I expected him to say something like, um, you know, hitting my head on door frames all the time, or um, sitting in an airplane seat, or, um, you know, things like that. You know what his least favorite thing was about being tall? The first thing everyone said when they saw him was, do you play basketball? That's it. That's all anybody ever saw about him. He was tall, so he must play basketball. And Keith, God love him, was the least coordinated person I've ever met. And he didn't really like sports. In fact, what he liked to do was play the alto saxophone, which when you're six foot seven is kind of a funny thing to watch, <laughs> right? That little alto saxophone. But he was really good at marching band, except for everybody else's feet were too small. Keith. You're really tall. Do you play basketball? Or what about my friend Matt? Matt Pratt, in fact, um, who was from a town in Wales that is unpronounceable because it has no vowels in it, and it's 27 letters long, and I'm not joking. And Matt Pratt looked like an English person, talked like an English person, and acted like an English person, which meant he drank tea instead of coffee. But it also meant that he was exotic for us West Virginians because he had an accent that wasn't, you know, the West Virginia accent. And so everybody always asked Matt the same question. How much do you like America? Do you like living in America? And then they would follow up with that a series of questions about living in England, like, does everybody really drink tea in England? Do you eat that weird sausage, right? I got to the point that summer that we were working together, Matt would no longer answer the questions. He just pointed at me, right? They would ask him a question, and he would say, don't talk to me, talk to her, right? And walk away, because he was so annoying. And we often ask about memorable things. And my, one of the memories that stick out to me from 9-11 is this. I had a friend whose name was Khalil. And Khalil was um, an incredibly devout Catholic who happened to be from India. 
And Khalil from India um, wore a giant crucifix. Um, I mean, giant, it was silver, because this was the custom in a country of so many different religions. Giant crucifix, silver, it was very bright. Khalil, who was from India, and had therefore had an accent and dark colored skin, um, at one point walked into my dorm room because other people had started chasing him down the street. It was 9-11 and they saw someone with brown skin and they chased him into my dorm room. And so we often do this to people, right? Even the people we know, the people we love in our lives, we reduce them to their lowest common denominator. You must be this way because you are tall, you must like basketball. And so we do this all the time, not just to people we don't know, we do this to people in our lives all the time. We reduce them to whatever it was the last thing that they did to us. Like, have you ever been unreasonably angry at a family member because they did something like 20 minutes ago? Or my favorite thing, when I wake up really, really mad at my husband because he did something in a dream, <laughs> right? And so we reduce him to the last possible memory I have, which he had absolutely no impact on because it was a dream, right? But we do this to people all the time. We reduce them to their lowest common identity factor. And this, believe it or not, happened to Jesus. It happened to Jesus from almost the minute that the church was founded. You see, they were trying to simplify Jesus' legacy this early church. What is it that makes Jesus Jesus? Let's reduce it to the lowest common denominator. Let's make Jesus easy. Let's make being a Christian simple so that we can understand it, so that we can control it. And so from the very beginning of the Christian church, they had this argument about what makes a Christian a Christian. What makes them unique? What makes this group of people who claim to follow Jesus different? And it wasn't just like the Christians who were asking themselves this question. Other religions were asking this question. How are you different from that group you used to be a part of now? And why Jesus instead of John? I mean, John was in preaching in the gospel, preaching good news. John was baptizing people. God was, John was doing things. So why Jesus? Why Jesus and not John? And so Luke goes to great pains to explain why Jesus. If you read Luke's gospel, you'll notice that Luke spends a lot of time talking about the resurrection. You see, Jesus is Jesus because Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. Jesus was not like other people. Jesus performed miracles. You know that water into wine thing that he did? You know the way that he used to be dead and now is alive? You know, that Jesus, that's what makes him different. In fact, Luke goes so far into this narrative, this reduction of Jesus to just the divine part of Jesus, that he completely skips almost everything that makes Jesus a human in Jesus' gospel, in his gospel. And yet the story begins with a very, very human Jesus. Jesus is standing in a field and he hears the message from John. And he says, it's time. Jesus is standing in that field by the river and he says, it's time. And he walks down to the river and he is baptized. Not by John, but by whomever happened to be baptizing people that day. John walks, Jesus walks down to the river and he is baptized and he is praying. That's just it, that's it. That's all it took for Jesus to hear the voice of God, the voice of God which says, I love you who have been baptized. I love you who has come up out of this water. I am well pleased with you because you are praying and you are baptized. So what is it that makes this Jesus unique? What is it that makes us unique? Now, I don't know what you are reading or what you're seeing, but I've been hearing a lot of questions lately about what makes Christians a Christian. 
And maybe it just used to be accepted because Christianity was the dominant form of whatever. Everybody we knew was a Christian, right? And we never really asked, what is it that makes Christians Christians? What is it that's unique about you? What makes you different? It's not just being nice to people. Everybody can be nice to people, right? It's not just giving food to the poor. Everybody can do that. What is it that makes you a Christian? It's not even reading the Bible. Anybody can do that. And I think what Luke has to tell us this morning is this, that it's complicated. You can't reduce it to any one thing that makes you special or unique. You cannot reduce this entire religion to one person or one people or one kind of people. We all of us have issues with other Christians. Have you ever found yourself saying, I'm a Christian, but not like that one? And it's easy to reduce it to just that. I'm this kind of Christian, you're that kind of Christian, you stay over there. But it's way more complicated than that because we're people. All of us are people and we do the same thing that they're doing. All of us, we reduce it, we make it too simple. We wanna make it too easy. So what is it that makes you a Christian? If we listen to Luke, it's two things. Two things. The water right there. And the food at the table right there. And that we pray. And I don't mean praying like we sit down and talk to God. I mean that our lives are an act of prayer. Our lives are an act of prayer. Our attitude is an act of prayer. We're claimed in that water and given a name, and that name is Christian. And so our lives are different. And that makes it hard, it makes it complicated, it makes it challenging. And if you find yourself with an easy answer, the chances are that you need to look harder. Unless it's this, that you are baptized in that water, and you eat this food, and you live your life with an attitude of prayer. And maybe that means that we are Christians with people that we find to be difficult. Maybe that means we can't reduce ourselves or others to a label or to what's the easiest thing to see about them. Maybe it means that we have to be Christians along with other people who make us uncomfortable. Maybe we can't be mad at people for the last thing that they said because people are more than just the last thing that they said. If we're going to be Christians, then we have to live a life of complexity. A life that requires genuinely caring for people, even the ones we don't like. And a life and an attitude of prayer. So if you've been claimed in that water, then you have a name, and you have grace to mess up, and you have food to eat to nourish your soul, and you have the challenge to live a complicated identity and to let other people do that too. It's harder, but much more rewarding and much more true to what it means to be a Christian. Amen.